Good evening, everybody, and welcome to V Brown Bag. This evening, we have a trifecta, a triple play, a hat trick of worldwide employees. We've got me, Sean Doyle, and the illuminous, the illustrious, the very well-educated Christian Tregesser. Uh, <laughs> Christian, so so this is going to be a little uh, sillier than normal because all three of us have been working together for a bit, for a hot minute on various projects, and uh, Christian is really really good at DevOps. Um, I've I've spent some time in the trenches with him, and I'm excited to see what what he's got to present to us this evening about how to view and identify bias and ignorance in continuous integration and continuous delivery. The, uh, the, the DevOps devil in the details that we often deal with, with our, with our friends and customers. Um, Christian, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you? Oh, I'm just, thanks for asking. Mr. Doyle, how are you doing? You big trader loser. <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. This is actually a great Great conversation, and if you haven't seen it before, we had our, our last V Brown Bags. We talked to Dwayne McDaniel mm-hmm. about what your Git metrics can tell you about your efficiencies in your team. So it's good. Mm-hmm. You know, we're continuing the trend here, uh, and, and yeah, but I'm doing good. We doing should good. plan on doing a uh, a DevOps series, like like plan through the different aspects of DevOps, and then kind of like do a series and find experts on the on the various slices, not just the tooling and the processes, but like maybe even some of the management. <gasps> We could get Emily in here. We're doing it. We're going to do it. Okay. Good. Before we get all ahead of ourselves, let's do a couple of show notes. If you want to get in on the conversation, we are paying attention. Sean and I have our Twitter feeds open. Christian doesn't do Twitter. He's better than all of us. Uh, Sean and I, however, are watching Twitter. And if you want to at V Brown Bag or hashtag V Brown Bag, we will be paying attention. So if you guys want to shoot out some questions, ask us about the DevOps, well, ask Christian about the DevOps, and we will field them and uh, present them to him at the end of the presentation. So if you want to follow Christian online, tough, you can't. You're going you're gonna to see his LinkedIn link at the end of this, but he is not on Twitter. He's not, he hasn't told us what his Facebook is. He is a ghost in the machine. You can follow um, you can follow on LinkedIn for what it's worth. There you go. <laughs> and uh, I, I discourage anybody from following me, but if you want to, I am at Mistwire on Twitter. Sean? And I am at Cloud Osmotic on Twitter. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> but, but, what? but what, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> I need to get he's, trying, he's trying to say Twitter. he needs to up up his tweet game. That's right. <laughs> All right. So with that, Mr. Tregesser, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, and give you the power. All right. And I'm and I'm glad to see that your camera doesn't have that weird dark um, uh, Queen music video look in uh, in the Zoom client now. There we go. All right, I can see your screen. Can you see uh, which one? Which one are you seeing here? Uh, the the. Oh, now I see nothing. You should see. Oh, here we. Um, I was seeing a web browser. Oh, you were. Maybe. No, so, by, by by some ignorance. I, yeah. I see yep. your I see your mouse at the top. Sweet. Oh, you even put the logo in. Thank you. Yes, I did. So that's about the extent extent to, uh, one second. That is about the extent to which uh, my PowerPoint skills I took toward this. Like I I watched some of the other shows and they have like good slides. And that's, (laughs) this is not going to be one of those. (laughs) Even though I am a consultant, I'm not really good at the slide game. Anyways. You know, this is about knowledge. You know, if if it's if if the slide game isn't strong, it's the it's the knowledge that matters. Where I lack in um, slide prettiness, I hope to have in content. How about that? Absolutely, I know you will. I have faith in you. <clears throat> all right. So first of all, I want to thank uh, anyone who takes the time to watch this video to just generally hear about bias and ignorance uh, in our industry. Um, but if we're going to speak about bias, I feel as though I should be pretty transparent and say that, you know, this 
presentation is full of bias. So uh, this is primarily uh, my take on the necessities for continuous delivery. And it's, it's about continuous delivery, but it's not a technical talk. It's more of a declaration of dependencies. Um, in my experience, many are challenged and maybe even disagree with some of the strategy or the premise that I'll be you know, presenting today. And that's totally okay. I, I empathize with those who differ in opinion and I value those perspectives specifically because I'm a consultant, but um, you know, I think you'll either agree or disagree with what it is that I have to say today. Um, I am curious of any feedback that you all may have as well. We talked about LinkedIn, uh, but more importantly, I just generally enjoy dialogue, working through certain situations when working with each aspect about, or I'm sorry, mentioned in today's title. So engaging as dial in dialogue is the key message of this presentation. So I can be found on LinkedIn, like we've already kind of established one second um i started my career in desktop support i've been in it for over 20 years i've held various engineering roles throughout uh, my time for the past eight years though i've been working in consultant roles which aid in the development of delivery and the operations of custom software solutions some of the markets that i've worked in are energy finance online gaming multimedia streaming and uh, as well as the united states government now, during all of that time, I've seen and worked with a lot of really cool technologies. And <clears throat> there was a time where when you work with technology, whatever uh, organization you worked with, that technology stack generally equated to how convenient, you know, kind of in terms of development or uh, operations, your essential solution or your IT was. But I think that we're now beyond the phase in IT where really adopting new technologies results in certain advantages or really any type of advantages in terms of the business sense. Um, primarily because we're now intrinsically focused on like how technology can benefit our customers, not necessarily our operations or whatnot, but um, more how, how are we using technology for our customers' interactions? And really no technology has had a greater influence on how organizations do business today than the mobile device. And this isn't a new, a news breaking thing, right? Like uh, everybody knows that phones are becoming more and more of a, a integral part of how we do business, but this device has changed the game of business, right? It's revolutionized how businesses orchestrate value for their customers. It demands an adaptation of, of strategy in, in business. And in my experience, most of today's enterprise IT staff that currently exist are significantly challenged uh, to adopt to those, those new types of of uh, strategies. Um, most have never been relied on to provide like the new norms for today's digital commerce. So, you, you know, that's a tough thing, especially when you're, you're trying to kind of coach them up or assist them um, on, their, on their journey. So to expand on this, this overall experience, I'd like to talk of a bit of a story. This image is like similar to what I would consider my first server room when I, when I worked, uh, you know, early in my career. I know it's just a, an internal office room, but this was my first server room. So, um, but like many of the services that I worked with, uh, they ran from spare hardware like this. They were labeled with post-it notes and set on top of like office countertops. But you have to understand that like 20 years ago, we were just beginning to understand how to implement technology as a, as a business benefit, right? Um, IT was budgeted, it's incentivized to kind of enhance the performance of like certain business roles within the organization and necessarily it's technology solutions, but how can those solutions help certain business roles? So IT roles and processes were broken down into like independent skill sets, uh, tasks delegated to staff who traditionally perform the same repetitive tasks according to wh whichever business request came in. And this is essentially a system where technology aids in the support of people who are essential to delivering customer value. But like what's going on today in today's markets, enterprise IT is being asked to like transform, right? We, we need to make, we need to, to transition everybody from a, an aspect where we're supporting the business to really becoming the engine for the business, the primary interface for uh, customer interactions. 
And it's common for today's customers to expect a convenient and intuitive mobile device experience. We see this in the markets of uh, tech, uh, telecommunications, retail, food delivery, transportation, entertainment, banking, finance. And this is all done on demand in real time, securely and reliably. Now, to adapt to these new expectations, it's common for organizations then to take on innovative projects in like the context of how they do business. This is where we get certain activities like agile, DevOps, and digital transformations, which are pursued pr primarily for uh, the organization's technical teams and tooling. And during these efforts, continuous delivery is then targeted as like the new strategy for improving organizational performance. We then go through certain events. Uh, tiger teams are formed. We evaluate new tooling. There are technical plans that begin to take shape as the business prepares for the new type of revenue generating revenue generating engine, sorry, uh, that is required for the new business vision. And it's roughly around this time where I start working with, with clients, start collaborating on projects. And in my experience, there are common characteristics of transitions that are carried out during these uh, IT initiative uh, improvement efforts. So th these common trans transitions, I'd like to list them here. That's uh, primarily like software development staff is transitioned into agile development teams. We have operations SMEs who are uh, transitioned into DevOps or site reliability engineers. Ticket queues are replaced by Scrum or Kanban boards. The data center provisioning is transitioned into cloud provisioning. And uh, manual or hands-on administration is transitioned into infrastructure as code. So I, I want to make sure that I, I, I'm not representing that these transitions are incorrect or set an organization up for failure. But I would ask, do the transitions in themselves provide the required change to enable continuous delivery for the organization? So despite like uh, the common transitions that happen within projects, the resulting implementations can vary quite a bit. There are good and bad outcomes uh, to projects. And if you're not familiar with these charts that we're, we're seeing here on the screen, these are cumulative flow diagrams. They Ooh, provide familiar. They provide uh, a, an illustration for how work is, is flowing throughout uh, a technical process. And each line that we're, we're seeing here represents a stage uh, in a process uh, of a process that's required to deliver work or complete the work if, if you can, if you will. While they're like minimally detailed they're, and they're highly contextual, I value the perspective that these diagrams provide when I'm attempting to learn about uh, the established processes and internal systems that an organization is using uh, to do business. So on the, on the left side here, on the good side, there's a system here where we're seeing workflow in a continuous and sustained cadence of delivery. On the right side is a system where the planning and the delivery are like, they're out of sync. So the relatively uneven exposure of these certain stages uh, is indicating that work is actually sitting idle for significant amounts of time uh, before they're able to progress on into the next required stage. But more importantly, th these are beautiful charts. I, I love them. But more importantly are the outcomes, these things at the bottom, these characteristics at the bottom that we see. On the good outcome side, we have gained efficiency. So it's easier for the business to do what they want when they want. There's increased stability. This is like a reduction of unexpected outages throughout the solution. There's improved quality, and this is for the product, the thing that's getting created, uh, as well as the quality of life for those who are working in the organization. And that usually then translates into uh, high morale. There's high job satisfaction and pride in, in one's role in the organization. But the combination, the combination of all of these outcomes could be translated then into a competitive advantage in a given market. And this would be a positive result uh, for our improvement efforts. If we look over on the bad outcome side, we see uh, consistent failure to complete work is scheduled. So try as we might to, to get work done, we just can't seem to get it done on time. That then generally relays into significant delay in the delivery of the new business vision. So we're missing key deadlines or milestones uh, that have been promised to stakeholders or you know, people who've invested in the project. 
technical change, excuse me, technical changes are viewed as significant risk events. And these events might be restricted or guarded against as we try to complete work, actually get work done, right? Also, company morale is, is generally low and often the stress is high. So um, this generally doesn't, you know, generate a, a good environment to, or a healthy environment to kind of work in. But despite all the time, all of the money and the effort that's, that's uh, uh, you know, been, been spent on the project, generally there's no improvement that occurs. And the overall reliability of the solution may actually be worse off than, than originally when we started, right? So um, as, as people who work on these projects, a, a business executive, a project leader, or a technical staff role, the obvious question, the obvious question is, is you know, what can we do to increase the chance of a good outcome over a bad one? Now, we've talked about uh, the transitions that we kind of mentioned before, new development frameworks, new ways of tracking work, new titles. But what everybody wants to talk about and what everybody wants to do on a transition is the tech, right? Like um, these tools, like look at all these tools. This is beautiful. If you're not familiar with this uh, chart, this is the um, CNCF landscape. So this is all of the tooling that is available pr primarily for um, cloud native solutions, if you will. And it really isn't a good DevOps talk unless you have the slide uh, in your thing. So I'm just trying to, to kind of keep all that stuff up. But we start to kind of navigate through this ocean of, of uh, tooling options that are now commercially available. And um, I, this is overwhelming, right? Like this is crazy how much stuff there is there. It should be, I think, expected that you overwhelmed because they're asking you at the top. Um, and there are plenty of solutions and companies that uh, you know we work for or work with that can provide you direction through this. But um, many just look to this toolbox to determine what they're going to do or how things will be kind of implemented. There are many high hopes that are kind of hung up on all of these tools to provide the key component of enablement for continuous delivery, right? Um, but let's take it a little bit farther. Let's just say like uh, we have this magic uh, ability to, to make sure that um, all of the initial engineering and operations is done tomorrow with all of these technologies perfectly. We have certified roles and they know what they're doing and we're just going to implement and it all goes perfect. Does the implementation of all of this technical tooling, all of these new roles and transitions, which is available to all of their competitors in a given market, does that translate to a successful transformation? Right? We have to remember that the game, the game of business has changed. And the tools shown here, they can aid in achieving a desired vision. But do they do they provide the influence required to continue playing the game of business today? In my opinion, there is additional adaptation that may be required to stay relevant in today's markets. Uh, and this is where I'd like to emphasize the dependencies of continuous delivery. And I try to, you know, I think that these words get kind of a bad rap in, in general in technology. And so I try to, you know, try to make a little, little uh, snazzy look good. But in my opinion, improving quality and performance of technology, uh, of technical delivery, just uh, performance, it starts right here. But there is a common stigma towards bias and ignorance in IT. And that's primarily what we're talking about today, right? These characteristics of our technical solutions have been historically ignored or kept hidden. And as a consultant, the really hard problems emerge when these characteristics are exhibited as established best practices within a company. To provide further clarity and kind of context as to what I'm referring to, I'd like to dive a bit into each of these topics to better illustrate why I believe that they're, they're so important. We'll start with bias. So bias is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. And I imagine um, some may be confused uh, because I'm essentially saying this is a dependency. This sounds pretty horrible, maybe, you know, kind of negative, uh, something that maybe we wouldn't maybe want to work with. Um, and we certainly would probably don't want to be associated with being prejudiced or unfair. Uh, but I'm not sure if 
everyone has a choice. I'm not sure if anyone has a choice. Uh, there certainly is a, a possibility of being unaware of, of that type of influence. And it also might be even maybe an expectation of your role in an organization to kind of give this influence over the solutions. So if any of these possibilities exist, we have to ask ourselves, could our bias then be preventing continuous delivery in an organization? When I'm using certain tooling like cumulative flow diagrams to point out the existence of, of work that is idle in an organization, uh, but but asking and being asked by the organization to help with that that problem, I'm I'm often you know pointing out certain things and I'm provided uh, explanations or, or rationalizations which generally prevent um, an efficient and continuous flow of work, and so I'd like to relay some of these common rationalizations um, to kind of continue on. The first is we can't hire the right people. That's that's uh, that's why we can't do continuous delivery. Or uh, all changes to production must be approved by the change advisory board. Developers can't be trusted to uh, they can't be trusted to do anything. Nobody trusts you can't let developers do anything, right? <laughs> um, or they're like senior. Peer review is required to, to complete all merge or pull requests. So these uh, these statements they might be true for your organization today, but I'm hoping to perhaps uh, challenge that perspective in a way that could classify these same statements as merely highly positioned opinions. Um, the difference and the importance of of those two different perspectives. Uh, can usually be determined by asking why. Uh, now, I'm not uh, going down the uh, Eric Reese Lean Startup, Lean Startup Five Whys uh, strategy here. That's a great book. Um, if you've not read that book, I highly suggest it. But uh, we're just asking for one why here, one why, and that's a why for every one thing uh, in, in terms of those rationalizations. So why do we as an organization struggle to hire our desired roles? Why do we value the CAB process? Why can't we trust developers to make production environment changes? Why is a senior role required for merging code? Essentially, why is there a preference for a process which requires delay to a desired outcome? The senior peer review is one of my favorite. It's probably one of the obstacles that I encounter uh, most. I'm commonly asked to help organizations with uh, CICD um, you know, tooling, continuous integration, continuous delivery um, to accelerate deployments for for performance from 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 IT, and most of that effort is spent on the technical aspects of of automating the deployments. But they completely ignore the fact that it takes you know two weeks to a month to actually complete a merge request. So we might reduce something that goes from four days down into fifteen minutes. But uh, in the overall scope of, of the system, uh, it still, still takes two weeks to, to you know, a month uh, to, to even initiate that. So how much improvement do we see? And it's not that much. Asking why, though, is the first step to discovering opportunities for improvement. And it's imperative to continually ask ourselves, uh, could our established practices reflect an executive uh, department or role-based bias? The difficult tasks of true transformation often require a change in awareness and an enablement to improve the previously established processes. And rather than uh, submit in futility, right? We need to be able to change things if the organization wants to change, um, not so much just go along as, as we have or what's according to policy, because that's how we get to futility. And futility is the common mindset when you're frequently told that's not how we do things here. So the probability of increased awareness and enablement is directly linked to the talent of the organization's leadership. Transitioning to an organizational norm of acknowledging bias is not trivial and requires significant effort. <laughs> like an orchestra or a team sport, all members, they got to learn, they got to practice, they have to perform in a synchronized uh, collaboration to the best of everybody's capabilities and abilities. 
But leadership participation is a requirement. The leader, leadership roles must be open to feedback, especially from the technical roles that are expected to carry out the implementation. This is an incredibly hard concept to convey to organizations which focus exclusively on the technical aspects uh, of their transformation initiatives. But the good outcomes relating to improvement efforts often include the organization changing their behavior as much, if not more, than the technical aspects um, of the business. This is why so many DevOps practices rely on that foundation of culture. This is the foundation of essentially what Peter Drucker means when he says culture eats a strategy for breakfast. Um, we must have a culture, an organization um, that is, is open. So leaders who silence uh, or ignore those perspectives that are not open to those perspectives, specifically of the technical roles, actually prevent awareness of, a bias, of bias, and they, they drastically restrict the full potential of the technical workforce that's needed to actually implement improvement. Implementing or cycling through Agile frameworks will not provide the solution to enable acknowledging bias. I can't, I can't I've seen that so many times, but just switching your framework, your Agile framework, that's not gonna work. That's essentially the burden of the organization's leadership, right? That's who, the personification of the company culture, that's who needs to provide th this mindset, enable this mindset. So when you are pursuing a transition into continuous delivery, it's important to ask, does your organization invite a mindset which enables change? Does the management provide a safe environment to challenge established processes, which may be interpreted by others as lacking consideration or maybe even completely incorrect? When all participants of an organization are motivated to uh, pursue further information to, to validate their understanding uh, of the system, or even better, fails that validation and provides additional knowledge to the benefit of the organization, then we get an opportunity of learning. Learning involves a gain in knowledge, and this uh, gain in knowledge can also provide it direction when we're pursuing improvement. I'm hoping to present a case that acknowledging bias invites learning. And if we can accept that, then learning accumulates knowledge. And ultimately, there's no substitute for knowledge. This is a quote from, from uh, Dr. Deming. Uh, anyone who's studied lean uh, should, should be familiar with uh, Dr. Deming, but knowledge provides an insight to discover alternative methods for assessment while we're still able to retain the same values of the currently constraining processes. So before we're talking about values, when I'm asking why do we do certain things, we can still keep those values, right? It's desired result that we, we wanna maintain, but we might think about new ways of accomplishing those values. So if learning is a gain in knowledge or information, I'd like to talk about the inverse scenario. And many engineering cultures that I've worked with in the past have had a bias towards ignorance. They're commonly reducing the term into a negative connotation when it's communicated. But if we look at the, the definition here, ignorance is a lack of knowledge or information. That's all, like that's all it is. You'll notice that like there's no reference to a limit in competence. There's no reference to a limit in intelligence or a limit in aptitude, but an opportunity for learning. Uh, the ability to recognize learning opportunities provides you avenues for impactful change when custom technology becomes a critical component for doing business. So if we lack the humility to acknowledge that there's more to learn about the technical, technical solutions we create, then we actively prevent opportunities for improvement. And it's natural to be uncomfortable or maybe even unsupportive of people when they reveal ignorance that relates to their expected job responsibilities. 
Um, I think for many, uh, the term isn't normalized in their environments. This generally then indicates um, working in cultures that lack certain characteristics like trust, commitment, healthy conflict. And, and so ignorance is just generally kind of avoided, right? Uh, but I think it's pretty common. I, I believe that a, a good example of how common ignorance is in our industry is the frequent declaration of imposter syndrome. If everybody figures out how much I really don't know, like I'm gonna lose out, right? Like I, I'm already doomed. And you know, what if we were to leverage this internal doubt as an indicator for growth or, or improvement, right? Rather than a label of incompetence. A path of transparency, which could contribute to ours and, and everybody's future potential. And I'll be frank, I'll be transparent that I encounter ignorance on almost every opportunity uh, that, that I am a part of because I'm, I'm always learning something new. Um, the technology solution landscape, like we saw, it's immense. It's, it's, it's constantly changing. And you know, if I could acquire all of the information that was there, it's probably going to change tomorrow. So I mean, I, you, you got to continually you know, be able to learn about things. And com cognitive limits are a reality. They're not a limitation. That, that's, that's human. So I, I think the question or the advantage that most pursue is like, can you learn to improve? Can you learn to, to, to continue on? This is how we become good at our job responsibilities and grow as people. Uh, personal mastery is a key trait in the desire to continue on in a career. I think it's key to, you know, to, to stay healthy, but be able to learn. And in my opinion, you know, uh, acknowledging personal ignorance is a key characteristic of talented, composed, and valuable employees, uh, but in the right setting. They have to be in the right setting or it'll be squashed. Um, identifying ignorance provides opportunities uh, for organizations to learn and improve, and learning should be the primary motivation for implementing continuous delivery. It's not how fast we can go, it's how valuable we can go. You know, we can do that is to kind of prove out those, those experiments, and continuous delivery aids in that, but we should be continually learning, both about the systems we create as well as the value. So rather than uh, attempt to eliminate bias and ignorance, we should look towards the benefits and the knowledge right, that they can they uh, contribute. I see improvement initiatives as, as more of a journey rather than uh, a prescription. The ability to dialogue through improvement efforts which resolve systemic bias and ignorance in an organization uh, can provide these location points throughout the desired journey and everybody's journey, every organization's journey is different because every organization is different. <laughs> um, finally though, I am a firm believer that like acknowledging bias and ignorance, these things that we're talking about today, it's table stakes for good system design as, as technologists. And we've only kind of scratched the surface on, on the surface on, on the topic of systems thinking. I see acknowledges acknowledgement of uh, bias and ignorance as just kind of the beginning, uh, stepping into this, this world of uh, systems thinking. Um, but system, systems thinking greatly aids in the solutions for improving organizational performance. So understanding that there is a system, uh, we need to pursue knowledge about uh, its strengths and weaknesses, uh, implement hypothesized and validated change and um, that generally just all provides these methods for continuing to play in today's game of business. So if you're interested to hear more about this, I invite you to take a, a visit to Worldwide Technologies a, a digital platform here. I have an article that I wrote for the platform. It, uh, I think it pairs well with today's topic, and I'm able to go into a bit more depth on uh, the systemic aspects of, of kind of DevOps, uh, more importantly, highlighting the, the value and importance of the socio-technical systems that get you know, created primarily as, as organizations attempt to adapt their business strategies. And that's what I got. And uh, for everyone, I'll put the URL to that article in the chat right there. And I'll also post it in the show notes for anybody watching in the future. Nice. 
All right. So I have several thousand questions, but I don't, but I don't want, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, um, there, there's, so Christian, obviously you and I have history and I, I know where, where a lot of those slides came from and a lot. And, and so I, I don't, what I don't want to do is I don't want to relitigate our past. <laughs> so Sean, uh, what, what, what questions do you have on, on people, people process and technology from a DevOps perspective? So I guess, um, you know, if you had to, I really like the slide showing the good pro there, the, the process and the good process and the poor process. And, and then the follow up on, you know, taking into consideration those things, what would you say is sort of the, if you could say like three most important things to ensure that we eliminate maybe three is too much. What's the top thing that we could do to like, help our company grow towards that culture of, you know, eliminating bias and, and, and improving acceptance of ignorance. Is that like, so is somebody watching this, right? What, what should they, should they focus on addressing the sea level to say, you know, here's some data and here's the concerns I have, or is it something they can do internally? Is it something they can do by starting with themselves? Like what has the biggest impact? In, in your opinion, so, if that makes sense, question. For a good understanding of the biggest aspect, I would actually go to the the uh, the platform article because that's kind of really where we kind of go down. And um, to be honest with you, it's not so. If you just go down the street and take a left, and then to take a right, and then you know, like so directional. Um, right. Primarily in order for me to, to give that type of direction, um, I think that it would need to be a bit more of a, of a you know, a request, uh, kind of like a therapist. I, and I don't really go, I want to go there, but in order for a therapist to really help somebody, uh, they need to know that person, right? And so as a consultant, in order for, for us to really help out, there may be a specific request from a client, right? But generally... Uh, that uh, request shouldn't or couldn't um, maybe be taken as 100% accurate representation of what they desire. So we might be treating a symptom more than maybe the cause. Now, the best way to kind of get through that is to understand the subject, the organization or whatnot. And if there are suggestions, uh, if, if there are recommendations, maybe it could be considered thinking outside of the box, but if there are unexpected um, recommendations that happen, that's often dismissed or it's often um, discredited because it is so foreign, because it is just a different way of working. And I think that a lot of organizations look towards certain tooling to provide that influence. If I understand how this piece of technology works, then I understand how I should work. And it's more of, you know, if I pick up a hammer, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a carpenter, or if I certainly pick up a saw and want to start, you know, doing stuff, doesn't mean I'm a, I'm a lumberjack. I can, get, I can get hurt, right? And I can waste a lot of money. But these recommendations that, that uh, might come require an understanding that, those previous processes, the previous previous constraints, ultimately, right? There's not just one thing that we go in where we say, we know what your problem is. This is the first thing. It's really kind of getting in, using tools, looking at the system, understanding where constraints are, and then making recommendations and not just where one specific director or one specific executive uh, wants to make a change for an improvement, but it might be you spend all of that time and money and it doesn't really make a uh, difference because the constraint is somewhere else. So long story short, and I love the monologue. I know Chris knows that, but um, understanding that everything that's been implemented is from a biased position. And specifically, if uh, you know, you are trying to be innovative, you're not going to be able to plan that. It, like you need to be able to experiment 
you need to have like a certain vision and actively know that you don't know. And the only way to kind of get through that doorway, I think, is to think maybe I don't know everything or maybe the things I think I know need to be validated. Or if we're going to work as a, a, you know, in collaboration or as a team or get better performance, am I open to others' influences, um, that type of diversity? And so I think, you know, really we kind of dive down that rabbit hole, if you will, in, uh, in the article. Sorry to be so long. Yeah, I like, oh, that's, that's great. And I like the comparison to the tool because, I mean, as technologists, we work with all these tools. Like you said, the tool landscape is, is huge. And sometimes it's like, you know, if you're, it, 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 let's say you're a mechanical engineer and you're working with a certain tool that bends metal instead of like a welding torch. And then all of a sudden your company's like, hey, I heard of this really cool welding torch. You guys should start using it. it, it it's not, it, it can't be that erratic of a jump. It has to be a little bit more, um, there has to be more thought into it. Like the tools are there for us to use as technologists but we shouldn't use the tool to understand the process. We should have the process understand the tool. I think is what I'm is what I'm getting. Yeah, or, I can or take tools that enable so our can, business to move forward. I can take it even further. I've been on projects where really um, clients have bought the tool, and and they they're like, okay, we have this. We want you to kind of implement it and show us what can can happen with it. And so, you know, that lasts for only so long until you kind of get it stood up and it's kind of like, all right, here, here's the, here's the aircraft. Like, what do we want to do with it? Where can we go? Right. They, it, it, and, and I think it kind of doesn't really, the metaphor doesn't really work out there, but just building the thing, just getting the thing doesn't really get you much. It, it just kind of gets you the capabilities and what those capabilities are, um, generally shouldn't be implementing the same things that you were doing before. Otherwise, why do we have to upgrade the tools, right? And so if we're going to change, what does good look like? I talked about the, the you know, the peer review um, aspect. And we worked with um, a client where they had that system, right? They wanted us to automate all of this stuff that, that did get less time. But generally in front of that, there is a two week to four month, and I've heard even longer, just to get somebody to look at your merge request, right? Um, there's so much problem right there in that part of the process that it doesn't really matter if I went from, from four hours to, to 15 minutes, if it's still gonna take that long and then probably not even work. Like Those are the things that we need to kind of uh, work through. And so being able to say, what if we did your peer review in this way where we could, you know, give uh, automated tooling, I'm sorry, automated testing to the same configuration, or, you know, just ch we're talking about changing processes. We only get in those discussions if, if people are open to dialogue, right? If they're open to their own bias and understanding that maybe there is a better way to do that. Not that I'm the formidable consultant or that I know everything. No way, right? I I'm, I'm learning every time. But us being able to collaborate, throw ideas back and forth, that's the key to like, uh, you know, good, good business outcomes. And there's, and there's direction about that. Cause I think that's a hard part. So in, in the article that you provided, right. About how to do that, because I mean, a lot of people, you know, as humans, sometimes we're lazy. And if we, you, you hear the common idiom, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like to some people, that's where the bias comes in, right? Because to some people, it's not broken. This is just the way we've always done things. So I'm assuming like in the article that people watching this, they can go read like what to focus on to find that data to present to sort of move away the fog of ignorance for people or? I think, I think it's harder than that. I think it's uh, probably another entity or another branch of the organization saying that's broke, like this doesn't work. And, you know, they're talking about your stuff and you're like, no, this is fine. We're doing just fine. You, you know what I'm saying? It's all about incentives. It's all about uh, collaboration and, and, you know, we can go down a whole realm of DevOps vernacular and whatnot, but it, it, it requires system thinking, in, in my opinion. And the best way to get there is to understand that you're working within the system 
that that you don't know everything. And in fact, if if your stakeholders are looking for innovative aspects in terms of your business, you cannot plan that. If you could, then you're probably being lazy, right? Like if you if you could plan that type of change, then what have you been doing? Right? You're going to go through experiences that uh, require failure. And we don't want to sacrifice safety or reliability in all those aspects. And that's a whole new realm than just like, you know, running with the tool and 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 uh, saying I'm certified, so we're good. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Thank you for thank you for that. Um, yeah. Um, uh, real quick, uh, Autumn, did you have a question? Uh, I, I saw that you raised your hands. I wasn't sure. And then you put it down. So I wasn't sure if you had a question and then it was answered or do you accidentally misclick the button? I don't know why she's doing that. I, I, I find, I find that, um, oh, it was, it was your three-year-old. <laughs> nice. Um, a, an, another way to, uh, to answer that question from is when you when you're when you first start talking with that customer is is trying to figure out where they want to be. Um, one one of the one of the gigs that that Christian and I were on, there was there was a fundamental miscommunication at a, at a couple of different layers in in the organization as as to the the velocity of change that was acceptable, and and bring, bringing those those disparate um, opinions, uh, belief systems to, uh, to, you know, out into the light to, to have that discussion in the open was, uh, was, was something that we, we actually had to do to, to get things to move a little bit faster in, in the organization that, that we were at. Um, so back to Christian's statement, you know, communication, establishing a, a dictionary of words that everybody is working from are all, uh, um, hugely valuable. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people in process uh, to go along with the tooling of, of DevOps. Cool. Well, um, Sean, did you see any other questions from the audience or on the tweetosphere? I've, I've been looking, but I haven't seen, um, other, other than the three-year-old, were there, were there any other questions? <laughs> I think we're, I think we're good. Awesome. Excellent. Well, Christian, uh, I, it's, it's actually been a hot minute since, since we talked uh, when, after, after we wrapped up with that customer, uh, you, you and I haven't chatted in a little while. So thank, thanks for coming on. Thanks always for appreciate you. you coming on and, and, uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. It's all, it's always fun to, fun to watch you go. <laughs> Great talking with you.